to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Welcome to a special week for the What Bitcoin Did podcast. I'm your host Peter McCormack and this week I will be releasing six interviews relating to Mt. Gox. First up is an interview with the creator of Mt. Gox, Jeb McCaleb. But before that, I have a message from my show sponsors and I have a very special announcement to make first. I'm excited to announce that Kraken is now a sponsor and the official exchange of what Bitcoin did. How cool is that? So listen, I get approached by exchanges all the time and I don't really want to be advertising new exchanges every few months. It doesn't feel right that after you've maybe tried one exchange that I tell you to quickly jump to another. So I wanted to have one exchange, one which shares my values and one which I can work with to bring amazing content and ideas to you. And for me, as quite a heavy Bitcoiner, there was clearly one company and one CEO that was the obvious choice. So a month ago, I reached out to Jesse Powell. I told him my idea. I told him I was being approached by a bunch of exchanges and I didn't want this. I told him I just wanted to work with one. My preference would be that it was Kraken. And yeah, he liked the idea. So we met up, we had dinner, agreed terms. And here we are a month later and Kraken are the official exchange of what Bitcoin did. And I couldn't be happy about this. And not just that, when I told Jesse about the opportunity to interview Mark Carpellis out in Japan, and I was kind of umming and ahhing about whether to do it in person because, you know, there's quite a lot of cost associated with that. Jesse was just like... Pete, you got to do this. Give me a BTC address. I'll give you the money. Just go out there and do this. Uh, that's a measure of Jesse and a measure of the relationship I've had with him since we first met. And this is why Kraken were the obvious choice for me to have as a sponsor for what Bitcoin did. So over the next few weeks and months, expect to hear a lot more about Kraken for me, why I think they are the number one exchange for Bitcoiners and some of the cool projects we're going to be working on together. And let's not also forget about my other main sponsor, Block5. It is these sponsors that allow me to do it. So if you are interested in a crypto back loan, well, BlockFi is the leading crypto to USD lender servicing customers worldwide, including 47 states, and their interest rates are now as low as 4.5%. Also, BlockFi accepts Bitcoin, Ether or Litecoin as collateral. Customers can be funded in USD or GUSD, which is Gemini's dollar backed stablecoin, and you can go from application to funding in as little as 30 minutes. If you sign up at BlockFi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, you can get $25 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans under $10,000 or $50 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans over $10,000 and applying takes less than two minutes. That is BlockFi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I dot com forward slash what Bitcoin did. Okay, so on to my interview with Jed and the background to these interviews about Mt. Gox. So firstly, there was no plan originally to do this. I reached out to Mark Carpalis about a year ago when he did his Reddit AMA. He responded to me, but then we were never able to schedule something and make the interview happen. Fast forward a year and I'm in San Francisco and I have the chance to interview Jed McCaleb, which whilst I wanted to interview Jed, it wasn't done so with this plan for all these other interviews. It was only when I got back to the UK and the Mt. Gox story started to blow up again that I approached Mark and he agreed and very quickly had all these other interviews stack up. So the Jed interview wasn't prepared in preparation for the other interviews and given the chance I would do it again and probably have more questions but still I think it's a nice way to start off this week of interviews and on another note I'm sadly there are some sound issues with this. About halfway through the recording my sound desk died on me and we had to record directly into the laptop which isn't great. I'm really sorry I've done my best to clean it up but it's got this really annoying tinny sound and yeah, you're just going to have to suffer that and pay close attention to hit listen to it. So all the other interviews have been recorded at a much higher standard, but this one does have half of the interview with a kind of poor sound quality. So I'm very sorry about that, but I hope you can stick with it. If you do have any questions about the interview, feel free to reach out to me. You know, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And if you want to support the show, then there's a whole bunch of things you can do. That is all listed on my website. You head over to www.whatbitcoindid.com and click on the support section. It explains it there. I've got some lightning stuff coming soon, which is going to be cool. And I also want to thank my Patreon top tier sponsors. Firstly, make sure you check out vidyen.com who create open source plugins which you can use to reward users with virtual items or store credit when they mine crypto in their browser or on your WordPress site. That is vidyen.com, which is V-I-D-Y-E-N.com and honeyminer.com who make mining and earning money simple for anyone with a computer. Okay, so on to the interview with Jed. Like I said, I'm sorry about the sound issues that happened halfway through. I hope you can bear with it. And if you have any questions, do feel free to reach out to me. Good afternoon, Jed. How are you? Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. Whenever I do an interview with somebody, I always ask them at the end who I should interview. And I met with Jesse, obviously a great guy. And he said, uh, I should come and interview you. And... Obviously, 
I would jump at the chance, but I really want to talk to you about a lot of the background. What I've been doing with a lot of my interviews is trying to, because I only became aware of Bitcoin properly in around 2016. There's this whole load of stuff I don't know about that I'm trying to piece together by meeting people. So it would really be good for me because you're pretty much around pretty much from the start, right? Uh, well, um, the start of it becoming popular, I'd say. Like, I, I think when I heard about Bitcoin with their first Slashdot article, which I think was in like the summer of 2010. At that time, before the Slashdot article, I think Bitcoin Talk had like 200 people or something on it. After it had like 2,000. So I was in that first, that, that wave. Right. See, I don't, I don't consider that when it became popular. I, I think almost like last year is when it became popular. Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, like the start of it's like, like, yeah, people coming i guess yeah. and you were already involved in software at the time oh for sure yeah i've uh yeah i've been a programmer forever since i was a little kid so i've been involved in the, the prior project was a also kind of a distributed peer-to-peer -peer system like uh e, e donkey 2000 which is a file sharing thing similar to napster or BitTorrent, something like that so. yeah i read about that and yeah. so what is it that grabbed you about bitcoin um, yeah, I was pretty immediately taken to it. Uh, I, I just didn't really think it was possible to solve that problem before to, to solve this double spin problem where you could have people that don't know each other still transact with it without a, without a party in the middle. Uh, and I just thought that that was super powerful and awesome. Um, and got super interested in how it was, how they, how it was done and like all the implications and just kind of wanted to, wanted to get involved essentially. So, and now you work on Stella. Yep. So I usually have a couple of questions I have at the start just to try and get a picture for me of like someone's mindset it's going to be quite interesting to ask you these because a lot of my previous interviews have been with kind of maximalist people but right. what's your kind of take on the whole crypto space right now like your kind of summary of everything that's going on um let's see I know uh, that's a lot to get into yeah an <laughs> i mean there's obviously like a ton of stuff going on i, I think uh I, I think the crypto space in general is just way overhyped like the the amount of actual like use it has is like way lower than the amount of attention and money that's going into it. And I think that that's generally bad. I mean, some of that has been correcting over, I mean, this is, you know, 2018 has been kind of correcting the whole year. So like, I think that's been pretty positive. Um, but in general, I mean, there's a lot of innovation, a lot of cool things, but there's just a lot of stuff that's not technically, that doesn't really have technical merit. And I think that's kind of unfortunate. There's a lot of misallocation of capital, I'd say. So am I right? I read you say 90% is bullshit. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, <laughs> somewhere around. There. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's high estimate. I, you know, I don't. I don't really follow a lot of the other projects because there's just too much to like keep track of. But every time I kind of do a ran random sample, I'm like, this doesn't really make any sense. So, so what things do you keep an eye on? What are the things you are interested in? Um, well, I mean, I'm pretty focused on Stellar these days. Uh, you know, I think what we're trying to do is make a sort of a, a a universal payment network like linking all the different currencies and 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 financial networks together whereas like i think bitcoin is i, I view it as more of just here's a new kind of internet level currency that that anyone can use and it's kind of like free from government coercion or something like that i think that's kind of the driving force behind it whereas stellar is a, a slightly different than that so um uh so that's what i spend most of my time just trying to make stellar a success but how do you feel about Bitcoin right now itself? Do you do you maintain an interest? Uh, yeah, I mean, I still I still think Bitcoin's great. I mean, it's not in the ninety percent. I would say it's in the the ten percent of the projects that are quality. So, uh, you know, I, I still own some Bitcoin, and like I still I still follow it to some degree. Like I think, uh, you know, I would be surprised in a hundred years if Bitcoin wasn't still around. That kind of thing. So, right. Okay. Yeah. And. I don't intend to talk a lot about Stella today because I think there's other juicy things to talk about. Um, but what can you do with Stella that you can't do, say, with Bitcoin? Uh, yeah, so the, the main things are you can hold any kind of asset or token in it. So Stella was designed to tokenize other things. So it's designed to uh, basically bridge different networks. So you can put dollars in it, you can put euros in it, you can put, you can put Bitcoins in it. It's got a built-in exchange there. So it's got a built-in DEX, which they say now. So it's pretty funny because... Stellar came out, uh, you know, probably five years ago and, you know, it had this concept of a DEX and it. it had this concept of what is now stable coins, which is now all the rage. But I mean, we, this is what kind of the vision we had been promoting for a long time. And now I feel like the crypto space is finally like getting it to some degree. So, um, so I don't know. It's kind of cool. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's, that, those are kind of the main differences is like, uh, you can just stellar is in some way a superset of bitcoin like it doesn't just have the native currency it also has all these other kind of features that are 
that are built around being able to move fiat currencies around the world and, and linking these different payment networks together. So right, okay. The I haven't paid a lot of attention to Stellar, not for any reason to have anything against it. Uh, I just am quite focused on Bitcoin myself. But the only thing I tend to hear about it is that, oh, it's just a copy of Ripple. So is that a huge myth? Um, yeah, that's pretty much not accurate at this point. I mean, when we started, we used the Ripple code base, but pretty quickly we realized that we needed to kind of rewrite everything. And so, you know, we took a couple of years and did that. And so now the code is completely different. Um, the, the visions are sort of the same, obviously, because I, I, you know, I created both of them. So, uh, so that makes sense. But, but, uh, but the way we're approaching the problem is very different and the code is all different. So it's, I wouldn't say it's not really fair to say it's a copy of Ripple at this point. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I really want to ask you about Mt. Gox. Sure. Uh, well, do you know, one of the fun, most interesting things I found out recently, I, I was in a different interview and somebody told me, they're like, do you know where the, the name came from? I was like, no, I've got no idea. <laughs> and obviously they told me it came from that uh, card trading game, like yeah. Magic the Gathering. And again, that must be another thing that's missed me by, but apparently Magic the Gathering is still a huge thing. Yeah, it's actually bigger than ever, I think. Yeah, which is crazy. But yeah, there's... <laughs> so you actually built a trading platform for that first? Uh, yeah, when um, I think when eDonkey kind of wound down, I was just kind of messing around and I decided to see kind of if people were still playing Magic. They had, they had an online version. I just checked it out and I was like, this is cool but there's no way to trade these cards online so or not an easy way and so i made this thing mount gawk or magic the gathering online exchange and got that url um and then yeah so i made but i only ran it for a little bit and was like and then moved on to other things um and then i just reused that domain when eventually i learned about bitcoin because i didn't you know because at that point bitcoin was still so early i didn't want to go like think of another name or go buy one like it was just like i think people have a hard time realizing contextualizing what it's what it was like back then when you think of what bitcoin is like now i mean it, it was just very unclear that bitcoin would be a success at all that anybody would ever care outside this small group of like 2000 people on this forum so uh you know the amount of you know so, so that's why it was just kind of and, and the whole way i made mount gox was just kind of on a a lark almost just because i wanted to learn more about the like how bitcoin worked um, and this is just a good way to learn about the system. So it wasn't like it was ever intending to be like this massive business or anything like this. So, so the you didn't foresee having like a large percentage of Bitcoin on the exchange. It was more just having a play. That's right. Yeah, with. yeah. I, I definitely didn't think that we would ever have like a, a huge percentage of Bitcoin in the world on there. Um, and uh, you know, so I, it was more just yeah. I mean, I did think that the exchange would take off to, in in that small community. I didn't know that that small community would grow like orders of magnitude over the next year or whatever right so um so all these factors just kind of happened i i mean i thought i mean there wasn't really there was some other kind of like almost peer-to-peer -peer local bitcoin style exchange at the time but there was no there's nothing like mount gox where you could do like actual kind of trading with people uh the, the way that all the modern crypto exchanges are so i it was pretty clear to me that that would become the the standard way people trade the stuff but um that pool of people was only like again like only two thousand people so it wasn't clear to me that that would become like a big enterprise so so Mt. Gox was the first proper trading platform then? Yeah. Okay. So that's quite a it's quite a big endeavor to go under, right? Like how do you So what was what was kind of impetus to do it? Um and do you remember what the price of Bitcoin was when you started work on it? Like could you even get an accurate price? You couldn't really get an accurate price. People were just like trading on the forum in random places. It first opened on Mt. Gox, I think around like six cents or something like that. That's wow. like where the first trades were clearing. Um so yeah, it was like I say, it's like a totally different world than now. Like it's yeah. So, so how did you how did you even plan to build an exchange? Did you look at other types of exchanges like stock trading or forex exchanges? Um, I mean, I have I've done you know I've always kind of been interested in that stuff a little bit. So I had done some trading a little bit, like just kind of as a you know as a hobby, I guess. But uh, so I was somewhat familiar with it. So you know, obviously, I had made this like this this card trading site. Um, but yeah, I mean, trading's pretty straightforward. There's not, you know, you have bids and asks and they cross and then a trade is done, right? It's not, it's not rocket science, which is one of the reasons why I didn't want to keep running it is because it's, I usually like to work on things that are pretty, um, you know, kind of more on the cutting edge of, of, of technology. So, um, it wasn't like intellectually interesting to me. So, so when you, when you first started work on it, what were the kind of, 
key challenges you did have to get over? What was the new things you were having to learn that you weren't expecting? I mean, honestly, expecting? yeah, honestly, the main pr- like challenge with exchanges then and, and still today is just getting fiat on and off the exchange. Like that's the, that's kind of like the roadblock for like how successful you can be and like how, how much money people can put through there. It's just all like how much fiat you can deposit and withdraw like that. That's, that's by far the main challenge. And, and that's not a very fun one because you're, you're dealing with like, APIs of banks that are like old and crappy and like, and, and, you know, or just like random like integrations to different payment networks and stuff like that. It's just not very fun work. How did Mt. Gox handle Fiat from day one then? Uh, we used PayPal, uh, Liberty Reserve. Um, I'm trying to think if there's another one. Um, I think we would take bank wires. Yeah, I think those are the three ways. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can never get a PayPal account again because of it. So, oh, really? Yeah, they banned me for life. <laughs> they banned you because of using it for the exchange or because of what happened later on? No, using it for the exchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So how long did you get away with PayPal for? Uh, we got away, uh, it was probably like a couple months, three months maybe, something like that, four months. I don't know. It's for a while. Right, but, okay. Yeah. So do you think that's, well, what terms were you going against with that? In what sense? Like, yeah. what rules had you broken with PayPal? Oh, with PayPal, or... um, I think you weren't allowed to use it. You weren't allowed to use it for like e money. Like, there wasn't really this concept of digital currency back then. But, but for like e money, like things like I don't know, whatever that e gold or Liberty Reserve, things like that, you couldn't use it for. I think. So right. Liberty yeah. Reserve was the one that was eventually closed down. Right? They eventually closed it down. Yeah, I think I think the U.S. raided them or something. I don't know what exactly happened, but it was it's another thing, sort of like e gold, where is it basically like a centralized Bitcoin? Yeah. So yeah, right. Okay, so you open up trading day one. What was the first day like? Um, I mean, it was mellow. It was uh, you know the, like I just made it. I think I, I think I probably just made an announcement on the forum, the Bitcoin Talk forum, and you know a few people like started testing it out you know i think it was at that point uh everyone would get pretty interested in all the new projects because there wasn't that many bitcoin projects so anytime you would build a site people would come and like check it out and like poke it and things like that so um so yeah i mean i think people just started using i don't really remember anything that significant about it but yeah i mean i i was excited about it yeah (laughs) so at what point did um the volume start to get a bit serious like Um, did you have a any one of these kind of spiky bull runs in the fir- in that first year? Not well. I only ran it for like less than uh, maybe like six months or something like that. So like I didn't run it that long before I handed it over to to Mark, unfortunately. But um, so I think I think there was, you know, it was just kind of starting to get interest, like more and more volume. Like it was growing the whole time that I, that I ran it. Uh, it. I would never say it was like huge i think i think when he took it over i think it was only like two thousand three thousand people so it was still pretty small um i think even at that time it was only on pace to make like 100k a year or something like that I, it, it really took off probably a couple months after he took it over that's when bitcoin went from i don't know i don't remember what it was but it did this huge run up i think to 25 cents or something which was huge then, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? or maybe yeah. to a dollar or something like that but yeah. it, it, it was it was i remember it being pretty crazy Okay, so you, you you run it for six months. And during that time, like, bearing in mind, like, uh, I've been about two years heavily involved in Bitcoin. Yeah. And one of the things you're first taught about is security straight away. Right. What was the kind of security back in kind of 2010? Were hacks happening? Were weird things happening? Um, there were definitely weird things happening. Uh I can't remember. No, that was after. I mean, it was, it was definitely, it wasn't anywhere near to the degree it is now where, um, you know, I, I think if you're going to run an exchange now, you really, really have to be on top of it. Um, you know, I think again, like no one, there was just a small pool of people that even cared about this, you know, like 2000, 3000 people that even like cared about Bitcoin at all. So if anyone was to hack your site, it's from this group of people. Um, so you definitely, you know, but at the same time, it does have a value uh, on the internet. So people were, were like poking around at the site, like looking for, you know, you could see them try to like log in with lots of different things and things like that. You could see them kind of like probing the site. Um, but, and there were a few, like, you know, there was, we had a, an incident with some Liberty Reserve exploit that someone found, um, which was pretty annoying. Like their, I don't know, whatever, it's probably two in the weeds, but their, their API was really um, not not well documented slash well made so it's like easy to do this exploit but anyway um and what else yeah i mean there's 
like minor things. Like that. There was a lot of PayPal fraud. There's a ton. Of, that's really the reason why PayPal shut it down is because there was just too much, too many chargebacks on PayPal, which I knew would happen. Which I, it, but mainly I just thought that it was worth it to have again the easy on ramp for fiat, and then uh, like I was just going to cover the the PayPal losses. So like it's worth it. It's almost like, um, I don't know, like like advertising in a way. Like you you just get people to be able to use it. Okay, it's more important than than limit like eliminating all fraud basically. So. Um, and were you having to, what's like security part of your planning? Did, is there something you had to think a lot about, you had to build in at the time? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a website, so you have to like be somewhat conscious of security. I mean, an- another reason, a big part of the reason why I handed it off to Mark is because uh, like I realized that this is, it's starting to, to take like the amount of effort that you need to put into security was like something I didn't really want to do. And like, I, I needed to find, like, I needed to either like build a team to do it or I needed to find somebody else to run it because it was like, it was going beyond hobby scale at that point. So, um, so I thought about like raising money to like go build a team to do it, but I ultimately decided this isn't really the kind of business I would run or run again. Like it's not, I, you know, it's not as like intellectually challenging as I would like. Um, but I didn't want it to go away because I thought it really benefited the the Bitcoin ecosystem. And I think, you know, I think it did, uh, you know, until the ultimate catastrophe, but, um, it really like introduced a lot of, it was the really, cause like when I first started Bitcoin, it was very hard to get, to get actual Bitcoin. Unless you ran a miner, there really wasn't a very good way other than like messing around on the forum, right? So mm-hmm. Mt. Gox just provided this much easier way to get onboarded, right? So, um, so it's actually pretty beneficial to the ecosystem, I think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was clear that, that security, like there was increasing like, uh, attention on the site and like security was becoming more of an issue and like we needed more people to like uh look at that and that's that's one of the reasons why i handed off to mark so yeah. i mean i guess you probably didn't foresee a 20k bitcoin and it was still just i think people don't realize that back then a lot of people didn't think it would succeed or last right? oh yeah like it was it well yeah i mean definitely not in the time frame that it that it had or to the degree like i mean i think people were so yeah i think i think what happened is when i gave it to mark i think it was trading at 25 cents like few months later it went to a dollar and at that point people were ecstatic because it reached parity with the dollar we never mm-hmm. thought it would even do that right mm-hmm. so like that was like this like huge pinnacle right and so obviously like that's nothing compared to what it's done since then right so it's just it's just a totally different mindset so okay so you make the decision you don't want to run it anymore do you does mark approach you do you approach mark how does that relationship come about um, so i had i had uh I had asked him to do one of these bank integrations. Uh, uh, I had met him on like IRC or something. That the, the community was pretty small back then, so there wasn't that many. There wasn't a big pool of people to choose from, and and he was, you know, he purported himself to be like this awesome programmer, and I like had him do this this integration with a bank in Europe, so people could deposit euros and whatnot. Um, and you know, I, I think uh, you know he was running some other hosting business, so it kind of seemed like he kind of maybe knew what he was doing. And uh, yeah, I just had him take it over. So, um, how does like a handover like that happen? So yeah, I mean, it was kind of done in a, a, a kind of stages. I uh, I uh, first I don't remember how exactly it went down, but but you know, you kind of you give I gave him part of it first. I I think he early on got access to the actual server. He didn't get the any so that implied access to the hot wallet of bitcoins. The cold wallet, I didn't hand over to him until sometime later and the, the actual domain, not until later still. So just kind of like slowly transition this stuff as, a, as I got more comfortable with it. But, right. Yeah. And did he buy it from you? Well, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I, essentially, he bought it from me. I mean, for, for future revenue. But yeah. Right. yeah. Did so, you ever see that future revenue? Uh, yeah. I mean, he did. Yeah. He did eventually pay me some. I mean, not, not as much as I think he should have paid me. I, anyway, it's like, again, too much in the weeds. I, uh, the site had lost some money and I was expecting him to cover that too, which is one of the reasons why it was essentially free. Uh, but although not free, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, because he had that, that he, he bought it with that debt and plus he had to pay me some money in the future. So, um, so, um, so yeah, um, obviously in retrospect, it was quite cheap for him, but, Again, like nobody knew what Bitcoin would be doing at that point, and it was very hard to predict. So, um, yeah. was it a smooth handover? And did you get on with him during the process? Or um, the handover itself was fine. I mean, that that uh, that was fine. I mean, the it, the problem started to happen. There was some uh, there was some hack on to Malcox, like I think uh, four months later or something like that, and that's when it became very clear to me that Mark didn't know what he was doing. Um, and uh, like basically, uh, the site was hacked. It was it was 
he had to like shut down the whole thing. It was shut down, I think, for like a week. And like everyone was like freaking out because it was the only place to trade Bitcoin at that time. Like tons of people had their money there. Uh, this is actually like, this is before I met Jesse and Roger. They both flew over to Japan to try to help him. They, I remember them, they told me some story about how, uh, you know, the, the site was down uh, and and then it was the, it was Friday and the site was down. They said, okay, hey, what time are we showing up tomorrow? To, like, you know, get this going or whatever. And Mark was like, oh, it's the weekend. I'm not, I'm not coming. And they're like, what? <laughs> and like, everybody's freaking out. There's literally just nothing on, if you go to mountainbox.com and like people's money is stuck there. And like, like, it's just stuff like that. Like, he just does not have the right mentality to run this kind of thing, which is fine. But he should be aware of that and like try to get the right people, which is what I was trying to encourage him over the years, which was like it's like, Mark, you need to get someone that actually knows how to run a company or, or sell this or do something, like get get somebody in that can like help you out because this isn't your strong suit, right? And he just he just does not listen. So yeah. So you maintain some kind of relationship for quite some time. I, I mean, I, a relationship is a strong word. I, I uh I say uh, relationship yeah, in terms right. of I, I communication. Was, yeah, I would send him emails being like, Hey, you know, every once in a while, and these became less frequent as I kind of realized it doesn't even matter because of an email, but that was like the first time there was an incident. So like I, you know, I tried to give him advice and help him out. Uh, and he just kind of wasn't listening to anything I said. And then later on as the site was kind of like doing its thing and like, you know, like Mount Rockstar has, has had a stream of problems since, since like he took it over. And like, you know, I would try to, again, like say this kind of stuff, like, hey, you really need to get somebody else in here to help you. Uh, but he just doesn't, he's like stuck into a wall. Right. Okay. Yeah, it was very frustrating. Did you hold any responsibility? Is there any parts where you self-reflect and think there are things that you did that may have contributed to it? I mean, I definitely could have found someone other than Mark to take it over. I think that's like the number one thing. But uh, I, I mean, I had zero control over what he was doing after he took it over, and and um, so there wasn't that much way I could have influenced how things went down. Um, you know, I mean. Like ultimately, the way the, the the ultimate disaster there was surprising even to me. Like as much as to everyone else, that that he basically had this cold wallet that was drained over a couple of years and he lost like six hundred thousand Bitcoin. Like that is like insane that he was just never checking his cold wallet for for the, to have the accurate balance. Like that that's like mind blowing to me. Like I, I never expected it to die in that way. I thought that he would run it to the ground just because he's incompetent, but like like he would do a, like he was renting the most expensive office in Tokyo or something like that. It, it, like he just does like crazy stuff, right? Uh, so I thought that's what kind of would bring down the site is that it would just run out of money and like one of these others would just take over. But but the fact that he actually just lost all the bitcoins is like crazy. Next up, I talked to Jed more about Mount Gox and his thoughts on the hack. But before that, I have a message from my show sponsor, BlockFi. And listen, it's been six months since BlockFi started sponsoring the podcast and they've had a great contribution to everything I've done. Together, we've built up a really strong relationship and their business just goes from strength to strength. I'm hoping to head out to New York in a few weeks to catch up with them and discuss some ideas about some new product launches which are coming. But right now, I thought it'd be a good time to reflect on why I'm such a big fan of BlockFi. While 2018 has not been a great year for traders and a number of businesses have struggled or closed, I think it's been really great for finding the companies that are creating value, the crypto companies which are building the foundations for the future of Bitcoin. For me, BlockFi is one of a limited number of companies doing this. They have a product which merges the crypto and non-crypto world where you can use your digital currency for loans which for crypto holders is a much easier way of getting a loan than from with a bank. I love the plans that BlockFi has for the future and anything which gives more power to the customer is something I am a huge fan of. So listen, if you are interested in a crypto back loan, well BlockFi is the lead in crypto to USD lender, servicing customers worldwide, including 47 states, and their interest rates start as low as 4.5%. Also, BlockFi accepts Bitcoin, Ether or Litecoin as collateral, Customers can be funded in USD or GUSD, which is Gemini's dollar backed stablecoin, and you can go from application to funding in as little as 30 minutes. If you sign up at blockfi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, you can get $25 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans under $10,000 or $50 in free crypto added to customer collateral loans over $10,000 and applying takes less than two minutes. So you know the drill. Check them out at blockfi.com forward slash what Bitcoin did, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com forward slash what Bitcoin did. When did you first hear about the hack? Which one? The major hack. The, the, the fact. Uh, the big. The, well, the thing that brought it all down. Obviously, it was over a, a period of time with the 
uh, the cold wallet, but there were a few right. incidents together, right? So, so, so the, the big one was, so basically I think that he stopped Bitcoin withdrawals and, uh, and then, then it came out that the Bitcoins weren't even there. I, I heard about it with everybody else. Like at that point, that, you know, I, that was, this is, he has been, he had been running it on his own for like four years or something like that. I, I, I was barely ever talking to him at that point. Right. So, okay. um, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I even had money on that cost when that, when that happens. You had some there as well. <laughs> It's funny in doing this, everybody I meet has someone there. Yeah, that, but that's the crazy part. Is like I don't know why people are still keeping money there, but even I want to sell that. Yeah, I guess. So, so the hack happens. Obviously, uh, for, for someone like myself, who um, like Mt. Gox has this kind of shadow over Bitcoin, right? Yeah. But when you come in, there's like so much you don't know. Like I didn't fully, I can't still fully appreciate what that was like at the time. But a lot of people talk about that could have been the end of Bitcoin. Yeah, people say that. I just don't. I, I never got that feeling, right? It's like it was very clear that this was just an exchange, and like obviously a very big one and an important one. But it never seemed like an existential threat to me that that it, whatever happened in that box would be real, a real threat to Bitcoin. I mean, it would have maybe some dampening effect, but like. You know, ultimately, it wouldn't really matter, and I think that's what's happened. It ultimately, hasn't mattered. Like that's kind of the cool thing about Bitcoin. You can just kind of wrap around all these things. Like you know, it, it's the whole thing about Bitcoin is you shouldn't be trusting the central third party, right? So you know, it is what it is. What do you make of the whole rehabilitation process? Oh, um, I haven't really been following that closely, uh, honestly. But uh, I, I, it's it's funny that it's or not funny, but it's it's cool that it's like uh, that that. That the Bitcoin that they do have is now has enough money to like pay it back uh, in dollar terms, I guess. But uh, so I, I think that's a like uh, I don't know that, that's good for all the people that actually did have money there. So, so you'll do a payback. I guess I haven't filed the claim. <laughs> so, yeah. And um, did you see the Kim Nielsen report? The voice. Oh, the voice uh, acting. Yeah, the, I, I think I read the one after when it was like detailing how all the, the coins were like, lost over years or whatever. Yeah. Did you rate the report? Did you think it was good? Did you agree with it? Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I have no basis to agree or disagree. Like it, wasn't, it just seemed like it was this analysis of how these coins moved around or whatever, and the fact that like all this money was being taken over years. Um, but yeah, it was definitely interesting. Because it, it, that's the only thing I found, like, that makes it kind of a claim against you in there, right? He does have some stuff in the beginning that is just definitely wrong. How I was, like, using customer funds or whatever to, like, trade or something like this. I think, I don't know if that's in that one or some other stuff that he said, but that's mm. definitely not true. Yeah, and the so. one I've read, he said it was insolvent at the point he handed it over to. Well, I don't know what his definition of insolvent is, but, like, it wasn't insolvent. I mean, there was somebody running it that had funds to, to like, keep it alive and like pay, pay people if they needed to like that's not insolvent right? so. no I guess I guess the point was more that it was possibly operating a fractional reserve at that point because it didn't have all the bitcoins for all the customer um, yeah but that's just like I mean I don't know that, that doesn't seem like given the, the scale of the thing like basically when when he took it over it was short maybe like I think $50,000 or something like that it was on pace to make $100,000 it was it was like two months later, it was on pace to make like a million dollars. Like that amount of loss just is totally irrelevant to, to the actual business. And like that's like normal operating for, for any kind of startup. Like you, you, you're always operating at a loss. Like that's not a big deal. Like you, you don't expect to be break even like in day one, right? So I don't know. It's, it wasn't like, it wasn't, it should have been impactful to the now business as well. Or anybody's yeah. ability to get the Bitcoin back. No, I understand losses. I've run businesses. Yeah. I've run businesses into the ground, um, <laughs> and I've lost businesses. I've been through it all. Um, but the fifty thousand loss—that's the first I've heard of that. So you know, I'm thinking on the top of my head. But is that fifty thousand in loss? Say, is that because there was Bitcoin that were missing? So that added up to. So, a, so, so when when I gave it to him, there was no Bitcoin missing. There was just the there was just a liquidity reserve uh, that was missing. I think that's around fifty thousand dollars. Shortly after he took it over, uh, th there was there was a, a, a hack where someone stole some Bitcoin, um, and that's probably what the white side guy is talking about. Um, and but even that was just I think it was like thirty thousand dollars or something like that some, somewhere around there. So um, yeah, the white thing said there was a hot wallet stolen, but that happened 
while you were still in control. It, but he's wrong. I wasn't still in control. Uh, okay. Well, I, so I we both had control. It was during the right. handover. So uh, he, it was basically shortly after I gave Mark access to the to the box that Malcolm was trying to have running on. Right. So it was like that you know, that period where you were during the handover. Right. But but t- but I had already like but the site already belonged to him. Like I already like sold it to him. You'd already so, sold it to him, but yeah. which but you said it handed over in three parts. So which so part? basically we, we came to an agreement yeah. and I think it was around like very early February, uh, that we started handing over the site and like there was a I think a, a two week period where we both had access to the box. So so I could like show him what was going on and everything all this kind of thing. Like the, the actual site where the cops was running. And during that time is when the the someone broke in and stole the coins. So um yeah, so that, that kind of is what it is. But again, like it wasn't, you know, it sounds like a lot now because it was a lot of Bitcoins, but it wasn't a lot back then. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was like $30,000 or something like that, right? So, 80,000 Bitcoin. Yeah, 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 which yeah. I think was about $30,000 then. Um, and, or maybe even less than thirty five or something, but, but, uh, uh, so what happens at that point? Like the, so that, it, that's down at March the 1st, 2011. So that's yeah. in that period. Who, re- you realized or Mark realized? Who realized that the coins were wrong? Yeah. I think I was the first to realize, but yeah. So what did, uh, did you ever find out where the hack, how the hack happened? Uh, I didn't, but he may have, I don't know. Yeah. So what kind of discussions are you two having at that point? I mean, it was more just about like, hey, what do we do now? Uh, let's, we need to, we need to obviously move the site somewhere else because this machine has been compromised and, you know, get it somewhere that we can lock down again. Um, and, you know, what do we, how do we make up this loss? Things like that. So, I mean, the easiest thing to do was, the, the site is the site is making fees on all these trades. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could easily cover this loss in like a few months. Let's just like let's just divert that revenue rather than to like the Mountbox bank account, but back into like what's home and reserve, right? So that's what you two agreed. Well, that's what I advised him to do. Again, right. like he's running the site, like I, I can't tell him what to do anymore. Because so. I guess what happened, I'm just piecing pieces together there. Because you said then it, shortly after you sold it, it went on a big run. It did yeah. so if eighty thousand Bitcoin are missing it. Sure. 30,000 so, value and the price goes right. up 10x in 300,000 of this thing. Well, so it, it, so it was, the big run was to a dollar. So that it went to like, so then the loss became like 80,000 or something like that. So. Yeah. Cause then I guess then it's, that's the start of a fractional reserve Bitcoin, right? Um, well, I mean, that run also made a bunch of fees. I don't know how much he made in the fees in that. I mean, he should have made $80,000 in fees in that as well. Right. Yeah. So, so that so like if it's eighty thousand, I, I mean, yeah. I guess we we would have to know the price it started at and went to, and right. what he's doing with the fees and where he's putting yeah. the fees. But also, fees aren't bitcoins. So if well, half of the fees were bitcoin, half were dollars. So I would what I advise him to do was you know obviously put the put the bitcoin fees in there and then take the dollars and sell them for bitcoin to cover the bitcoin cost. Right. Okay. So, so that's what I advise him to do, and I think that's that's the whole like gox bot thing that like, somehow become nefarious when really what it's doing is it's it's taking the fees. The money that that Mapbox has owned and converting it either to dollars to Bitcoin, depending on what Mark needs, right? So, yeah. Another thing he has in there is that there was like a public hack via compromised accounts, and then the hacker gained access to your admin account. That's right. Yeah. What happened there? Um, I I don't I think it was I think there was some exploit in the forgot password form or something like that where they were able to like get it and then they got my account which had admin rights which could, which could like add balances to accounts and they. Use that to add a bunch of balance to one of their accounts. See, the one thing that's interesting is if you go through it, they, they, they're kind of totaling up the losses as you go, because then, then you've got the, is it, is it pronounced bitter mat? Well, bitter mat debts? Yeah, absorbs some debt. So that's, at that point, it's 102,000 Bitcoin, $50,000, and then. But see, that was a, that was some exchange that Mark bought, right? Oh, yeah, of course. I, I'm not yeah. attributing it to anyone. I, yeah. But, so, then, but, but like, 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 why do that? Why buy that thing if you, if you're not? Able financially to buy it, you know what I mean? Like that was like a decision of his. Like, yeah, but, I mean, possibly he he was out of his depth. He the thing is about this, I guess, on re, when you reflect back, you reflect back with the knowledge that that Bitcoin is now worth twenty thousand. Right, right. It always has been at twenty thousand. It's now worth three and a half thousand. Right. And you're not taking in consideration it was twenty cents or twenty five yeah. cents or whatever. Um, but I'm just trying to picture in my head what what's going on. Do you know? What it almost feels like. Have you watched that fire festival documentary? I haven't watched that. I, I, Oh, you've got to watch it. It almost <laughs> feels like a similar scenario once something just keeps getting out of hand. Because there's another one here. There's a compromised database in September 2011. Another 77,500 Bitcoin taken. And then a hot wallet was stolen again in October. And that was, yeah, 
630,000 Bitcoin. So it seems to be like a thing that just got further and further. And right. He got more and more out of his depth. Yeah. When did you last talk to Mark? Um, I mean, it's been years. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've only talked to him on Skype a couple of times. Right. Okay. Over voice. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's probably about 2011, or maybe 2012 was last time. See, I read a thing about it there. So the way the rehabilitation was done, people were going to be paid back in dollars. Right. And he could end up becoming a billionaire out of this. Did you read about this? I, I heard that. Yeah, that would be pretty unfortunate. So I think, yeah, it's probably a bit more than unfortunate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Probably, do you think there's a better way of handling it? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's definitely not the way it should go down. I mean, I don't think that's uh, uh, in the cards now just because Bitcoin has come down a lot. But, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, that would just be kind of a, I don't know, travesty of justice, I guess. If he ended up walking away with that much money, do you hundred percent trust him, Mark? Yeah, no, I don't trust him at all. Yeah, um, and I guess there's two types of trust here. There's whether he tells the truth, yeah. and whether he's just incompetent. Incompetent. You can trust somebody sure. as a human, but know they're incompetent, or you can also not trust them yeah, because I, they're a, they're a liar. Yeah, I mean, I don't know Mark super well. Like, I, I, I you know. You probably know him as well as I do, honestly. Like, I, like I, uh, no, I've no, I don't know what to <laughs> like, <laughs> like, 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 I've only talked to him a couple of times on Skype and a little bit on like IRC and stuff, right? So, um, so I, I don't trust him his competence at all, and I don't really trust him not to lie. But, but I don't really have that much information. It's just kind of like the vibe I'm getting from from what's happened. And like, it just seems shady in some degree. You have lawsuits against yourself, right? Uh, yeah. Are they still ongoing? Uh, there's. What is that? Can you talk, talk to me about that? <laughs> I really don't want to talk about that. You don't want to talk about that. Can I, rather than ask the details about it, but it relates to Matt Cox, right? Uh, yeah, but I really don't want to talk about this at all. This whole, this whole, like, well, what my Matt Cox lawsuit situation is. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Well, we can skip that. Um, okay, give me a second to this bit. Okay, so, like, you've, like, what's your kind of, like, whole, like the summary of your feelings about the whole Mount Gox thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, a little complicated. I mean, it's uh, I think it was an interesting thing to do, and I, I really do think it really benefited the Bitcoin ecosystem at the time. I mean, but uh, it's really really frustrating the way it shook out and like the way it, what it became. I mean, that run by anyone competent, it could have become like easy, like a billion dollar business, right? It could have you know it could have it could have maintained like. If it had like 80% of the liquidity uh, at, the, at the time, it could have maintained that position for a long time because it's liquidity kind of begets liquidity, right? So it's like, it was this huge cash cow and then it just all kind of fell apart. And obviously part of that was just like very painful for a lot of people, which is like super tragic. Like none of that had to happen. And I think that stuff is, is, uh, really bothers me. Um, and then also it just, it just has this ongoing like, um, like people like, drag me into that, I think kind of a, a pretty unfairly that like they blame me for a lot of the problems there. Like even Mark has tried to put this on my shoulders being like, well, the site was short, like, you know, you know, like $50,000 when it started. So therefore I lost 600,000 Bitcoin. It just doesn't even make sense, right? To like, that, that is not why the site died. Like that's nothing to do with it. It's totally wrong, right? Um, and, uh, so having to kind of like constantly fight that, like PR battle or something is a little bit, uh, irritating. I don't know, it is what it is. I think, um, uh, like, I, in general, I don't dwell that much in the past, so I, I don't worry about it too much, but, uh, you know, it, it is just, it's a little tragic how it went down. It could have just been, it could have done, it could have had a much better outcome than what it did for, for me and everyone else. So there must have been some quite stressful times for you with it as well, though. Um, well, that's, that's the frustrating thing. It was, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily, it was frustrating for sure. It was like super, super frustrating, but it wasn't necessarily stressful because there was no way that I could affect the situation. So when I would see Mark making a decision that it was just like clearly wrong, there was not, there's no way I could step in and do it. Like to the extent I would try, it would just, it, he would just ignore my email or, you know, you know, not really respond to me. So, um, I, I basically had to just ignore it because it was. Say the handover had been two weeks later. Yeah, because that hot wallet still have been compromised. But maybe I, I don't know how that they got. I don't know how they got access to it. It's I, you know uh, the timing is a little weird. Uh, but but you know, I mean, again, like I don't think I don't think that that compromise 
that particular compromise is really material to the outcome of Black Ops. I mean, it is some amount of money, but it, like again, the site could, was easily making that much revenue and could have like could have like covered it, right? So, mm-hmm. um, you know, um, it, you know, it sounds like a lot now, but ultimately, like back then, it was just not a big deal. It's more like a big chain of events, right? Yeah, I guess. I mean, the, really, it seems like the fundamental thing is this this compromise. That I didn't know about until the, the WhatsApp article, and I don't think anyone did, where someone was like slowly draining his cold wallet over years, like it literally over over the course of two years. I think someone was mm. stole six hundred thousand Bitcoin from him. Like that is the nail in the coffin. Like, that's the thing that took down that cost, not these other like smaller things, right? And I think the smaller things are indicative of, of the security story there, but but. Um, they're, they're not the things that actually led to its downfall. And we still have exchange hacks today. I mean, Cryptopia has oh, sure. been hacked yeah. twice in what, a month? Yeah. <laughs> Are you still amazed that exchanges get hacked, or do you think it's just uh, an issue that will always no, exist? No, I'm not. I mean, it's it's a hard problem. I mean, it's like Bitcoin is like the ultimate thing to hack, right? Like that's, that's or someone holding Bitcoin is the ultimate thing to hack. Like that's, it's a prime target, right? Like, I'm almost, I'm almost surprised it doesn't have more, to be honest. You know? So, I mean, there's a, these exchanges are holding like really a lot of money. So, and it's something that they can easily, someone, even that works in exchange, can move away. And, you know. A couple of things to finish on. Um, you've been in the crypto industry for 10 years, right? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you've seen a lot. You've probably pretty much seen more than anyone else, right? You've seen the first exchange you've been involved in. Ripple, you've been involved in Stella, a lot of things. What do you think is the most important things that need to happen to take the crypto industry forward in a positive way? Um, yeah, so I mean, the most important thing is this stuff really has to be start being used by real people um, for real things. I mean, uh, it's still, you know, yeah, it's been 10 plus years now and still there's just not really good use cases, not really people really using this in the real world. And that's almost 100% what we're focused on at Stellar and Interstellar, like we're, we're trying to make it real. Like, uh, you know, this, it's, like I said in the beginning, like, it, it, like crypto kind of suffers from its own hype and, and that just leads people to kind of like make all these like BS claims and BS projects just to raise a bunch of money and just to like take it and run basically. Uh, and, you know, this can only last for so long and until, you know, people stop believing it essentially, but, but, uh, but yeah, like it, it's just super important that, that we find a way, like we as a collective industry find a way to, that this stuff is used uh, in, in real life, right? So, um, and I think we're getting closer, but it's taken much longer than I think anyone has wanted it to take. So. Do you have any sympathy with the more maximalist view of things that it's very difficult to create lots of different coins and people don't want to have lots of different coins and lots of different tokens? It doesn't make sense for user experience. And- um, and, for, and it doesn't make sense in monetary terms. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't call it maximalist. I, th- I just think um, of most, like, again, like this goes back to my earlier comment, like 90% of these things are garbage. It's just because, uh, you know, like you don't, you don't need a, a specific form of value to like buy, a, like, you know, like if you have a, something that wants to buy like pet food, you don't need a pet food coin. Like you, you can use Bitcoin, you can use dollars, you can use like these kind of standard currencies. You don't need like a, a specific currency for this one use case. It doesn't make any sense. In fact, it like it, it like defies what is good about a currency that you can use it in multiple places. It's just barter at that point, right? So, um, and a lot of projects are have are along those lines. And I think I definitely agree with that point. I don't think that there should just be Bitcoin or just be Ethereum. Or, you know, I think there'll be lots of these things. They're, they're again, they're all kind of solving like different use cases and different. They fill different niches in the world. Um, just like there's not one kind of database, there's there's lots of different kinds, right? There are one kind of programming language. You, you, need, you need multiple to solve different problems, um, and and I think I think that there will be uh, uh, you know one standard one that's solving each of these problems, but there are lots of problems basically. So. What is the problem that the the is lumens a token? Yeah, we call the token lumens. Yeah, what what is the problem that that solves? So, I mean, well, the seller network in general solves this problem of, of making, moving money around work a lot more like email, where you can have, you know, you can, you know, you can have your account at a bank and you want to send it to someone's mobile money wallet and it can just go seamlessly. We don't really have to think about where people are storing their money or what currency they're using. All these things just become interoperability, interoperable, right? So it's, it's just a way to, um, again, just make, bring payments into the internet age, right? And so that, that's what seller solves and Lumen is a piece of that. Okay. 
And did I see about $120 million of Lumens being given away? Uh, so, yeah, we announced something with blockchain.com. Uh, uh, well, they have both. Oh, is it both? Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're doing a big uh, distribution with those guys. Yeah. What do you... They, so I wasn't aware until you announced that, that there's a lot of people who have kind of quite, quite big criticisms of blockchain.com. Uh, I, I don't know. Really? Do they? I don't know. <laughs> well, you're not aware of any of their bad press? Uh, not really, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's surprising. Yeah. Why give away 120 million? Like, who should be claiming that? Does that potentially risk a dump on the price on Stellar because people just take it and then sell it? Um, well, I mean, the, the hope is, the thought is that if you do it thoughtfully, right, then uh, what, what you're really doing is increasing awareness of the network and like you're getting in the hands of a lot of people that, that could potentially become users of the thing. Um, and it's, it's sort of, um, you know, it's similar to the way PayPal grew a little bit earlier where they would give out $10. It's like a way to get people to try your system and, and start using it. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, if you do it in, in, in such a way that you're actually gaining more adoption than, than you're increasing the supply, then it, it shouldn't. Um, but I mean, really the purpose is to get, uh, is to make, again, to make Stellar this usable, uh, system. And to do that, it needs to be in the hands of lots and lots of people. So our main driver for this whole thing is to, is to do just that, is to get it in the hands of millions of people. Uh, and then they can start building stuff. They can start transacting with each other. They can start actually using the currency. Um, and again, to make these things real. Like I think, I think that's what we need to focus on more than the price. If, if the price is sort of secondary. In, in my view, like it's uh, it, the the main goal is to make the network useful. I, I put a tweet out the other day where I was I said I kind of feel like most of these projects now, in hindsight, and most of these tokens would be probably better as a stable coin because the volatility isn't really helpful to anyone. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it depends on what you want to do with the thing, but yeah. Yeah. All right. So before we close out, just a couple more questions. Um, how do people keep an eye on what you're doing? How do people stay in touch? And what are your kind of closing comments about Stella that people should be aware of? Sure, yeah, uh, if you go to the website, stella.org, uh, you can sign up for the newsletter. That's probably the best way to, to stay informed. You can join our Reddit, our Stellar. A uh, lot, of, lot of good activity there. Um, and yeah, uh, we're super excited about 2019. There's a, there's a lot of projects in the works. Um, and yeah, we're growing the team a lot. Um, making we're working a lot on scalability. Uh, working on this project called Starlight, which is kind of our payments channel, our version of Lightning, essentially that will interoperate with the, the the rest of the payment channel efforts out there in the world, and also bring that that kind of technology to Stellar itself. Um, it should be pretty cool. Um, can you think of what else is happening? Lots of lots of cool things. Have you reserved the seat on Richard Branson's? Uh, oh, on the uh, uh, wait, classic. Is, Oh, is it just go up in space and come yeah. back? Um, I, you know, I'm only interested to go to another planet. So like, right, it's got, okay. when, he, when he has that going, I'll, I'll sign up for any sort of generation ship or something, not, not just a quick. Have you never been tempted to be one of these people who pays to go up on the uh, International Space Station? Um, uh, that would be kind of cool. But again, like, it's just, it's not as enticing as like going to see a whole new world. So, yeah. Did you, did you watch First Map? I, I did, yeah. I assume you, assume you saw it in the cinema, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, the moment where, I don't know about you, but that moment where they're on the planet, I thought was on the moon was pretty epic. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Kind yeah. of blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. First Man is a pretty uh, great movie. Is, yeah. I think it was, for, personally, for me, it's probably the best film of the year. Um, really? Yeah, I think it's just amazing how much, uh, I think, how much mileage the United States got out of doing that. Like, I feel like it's like, gave them so much like social capital in the world for, for years because they were the first to do that. Like, I don't know, it's pretty cool. Actually. Yeah. So. Well, listen, thanks for your time. It's great to meet you. It's great to hear about some of the history and I uh, hope get to meet you again sometime. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, so what did you make of that? What did you make of Jed? i got to say... Whilst I'm not a fan of Stella and I haven't really spent much time looking at it, it was great to catch up with Jed and talk about the early days of Mount Gox and get an understanding from him of why he created it, why he handed it over to Mark and some of his thoughts about the various hacks. Jed himself has also got a lot of flack in relation to Mount Gox, but 
we have to kind of remember that Bitcoin was trading at about six cents when he first launched it. And within six months, he handed it over. I guess he had no idea of what's to come for either Bitcoin or the exchange. In hindsight, it was kind of beneficial to have sat down with Jed and talked about Mt. Gox and Mark in preparation for my interview with Mark that I didn't even know was coming. So yeah, I'm glad I did it. In hindsight, I would have had some different questions, but you know, I had no idea how this was all going to play out. As ever, thank you to anyone who supports the show, whatever you do, whether you're just a listener who shares it out with your friends or whether you've left me a review on iTunes or whether you're a sponsor. Everything you do to contribute to the show helps me to keep this going. And if you do want to support the show, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. So firstly, make sure you listen to the sponsors. They're the people who really make this happen for me. Without them, I don't have a show. And if you don't want to listen to the sponsors, then you can subscribe to an ad-free version on Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash what Bitcoin did. For $5, you get the show early without any ads. If you don't want to use Patreon, you can pay in crypto. Drop me an email. I'll give you an address and I can add you to the distribution list. I've also actually just set up a tipping.me account and somebody's actually paid me in Lightning, which is super cool. So if you want to do that, then give me a shout. We can make that happen. If you want to become a show sponsor, I haven't got many slots left now, but if you are interested, do feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Downloads are growing like crazy. January is a record month. February is going to be another record month. You can leave me a review on iTunes or you can click on the subscribe button that helps with my ranking and you can follow me on social media. I'm on Medium. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm at whatbitcoindid on everything and my personal Twitter is at Peter McCormack. You can check out my website which is www.whatbitcoindid.com and sign up to my newsletter and you can share this out with your friends and family. Tomorrow I'll be releasing my interview with Mark Coppelis which was also video so keep an eye out for that and remember if you do have any questions feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Thank you.